Thank you for joining us. I'm Dan Allen at Leon Springs Baptist. We love God, but we love God supremely, and we love people, and we're busy making disciples. Those are the words of Jesus Christ and the Great Commandment and the Great Commission. We're praying that God's going to use us to bless you, to encourage you, and to challenge you in your walk of faith. Thank you for joining us, and we hope if you have the opportunity, you'll come and visit us Sunday morning at 9 a.m. or 10.30 a.m. At 10.30 a.m., we also have a Facebook Live and a YouTube option. Again, we love God supremely, and we love people. Thank you for being here, and we pray that God uses us to encourage you in your journey of faith. already <laughs> kind of preface Bart McDonald being here. Uh, Bart's been here several times before. He is, man, he loves the church and he loves to show you God's provision so that you can give freely back to him. And so um, if you don't know that, Bart, uh, Bart is, um, I guess you're the head, you're the, like, the big cheese big chief. Uh, of the Southern Baptist of Texas Foundation, and they are the ones that literally financed and helped us, helped us, uh, came alongside of us to build this beautiful worship center and our family life center and all of the renovations of our church. We're so grateful to the foundation for, for being there for us. And um, you're going to enjoy this today. Bart ministers to churches all over Texas, and um, man, he's been a corporate banker, but he's also been a senior pastor, so he knows all sides. Um, and so, would you give me a, uh, would you join me in welcoming Mark McDonald this morning? Oh, stop. Let's go to the Lord in prayer, shall we? Father, as we approach the threshold of your text, we come as a hungry people. We come as a people in need to, to hear from you, your words, your instructions. And Lord, it, um, it's impossible for any of us to know everything that's going on in the multitude of lives in this room, but I know there's hurt. I know there's challenge. And uh, so, Father, I pray that as we meet together in the name of your Son, the Lord Jesus, and he manifests his presence uh, amongst us, that now you would speak to your people. Not the words of a mortal man, but Lord, to take control of the thoughts of my mind, the words of my mouth, so that that which I speak might come from you and be spoken to your people. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Well, it's good to be with you this morning. If you're visiting with us this morning, let me greet you in the name of our pastor, Pastor Dan. When is Pastor Dan back? Okay. July 25th. That's my 35th wedding anniversary. So, uh, Brother Dan will be back on my... Th I won't be here. <laughs> if you are visiting with a Dan's a fine man, appreciate him, know his staff. Now, you, you, you'd, uh, you'd search a lot of churches to find one as good as this. I'll tell you what, that praise team did a phenomenal job. But uh, we're going to be in the book of Ephesians this morning. So, if you have your copy of God's Word, turn there with me. The summer theme that we've been focusing our attention on is this notion of overflow. The proposition of God's word, the promise of God's word is that Jesus said, come unto me and I will give you life and I will give it to you abundantly in an overflowing manner. And so uh, I listened to the uh, five sermons that have been preached up to this point uh, and uh, they, were, they were very well done. And we're going to shift a little bit of a focus this morning uh, to you, quite honestly. Uh, most of the sermons that have been delivered in this series so far have been focusing on some of the things that God has done. But here's the question, the proposition. What must you do in order to experience the abundant, overflowing life that God promises? So I've entitled this morning's message, The Five Imperatives. 
of an overflowing life. It's taken out of the totality of the book of Ephesians. We're going to look at a lot of text, and that's, uh, that's going to be a difficult task. When I was a senior pastor, I spent 26 weeks preaching through Ephesians. This morning, I'm going to try to cover it in one sermon, which is almost impossible. We'll barely scratch the surface. But as you're turning and preparing to go to God's Word, let me tell you a story. Uh, I'm from southeast Texas from a little bitty country town called Winnie, Texas. It's a small place, about 2,500 folks. Grew up in a very small community. My parents were educators, but they were also professional musicians. My dad, when I was a, just a small boy, played for Lawrence Welk. Met my mom on a bandstand. My mama was a singer. My daddy was a piano player. It kind of sounds like a country song, but that's the way it happened. And so I grew up in a musical family, and uh, the pattern in our household uh, during the school year was my daddy would get up early in the morning, do a bus run. He taught school during the day, would come home, sell cars in the afternoon, run to the house, take a nap, and then probably somewhere between three, five nights a week, just depending on what season of the year it was, my dad would leave the house and go uh, play in some venue. And so I grew up with a brother, uh, 10 months older, 10 months and 13 days older than I am. So we were inseparable. And our pattern was when mom finished school, we'd pile in the car with mom. We'd come to the house. Uh, uh, we, We typically would find dad on the couch taking his nap because he would stay up late as he played music. Mom had dropped the boys off at the house, gone to the grocery store. And my brother and I's pattern was we came home and we watched three shows religiously every afternoon. And then we would go outside and play until mama had dinner ready. She'd call us in. We'd eat dinner as a family. My dad would go play music. And so the three shows we watched were Leave it to Beaver, Hogan's Heroes, and Gilligan's Island. And if you're young in this room and you've never watched those shows, you have not lived yet. So here's the, here's the story. My mom's coming home from the grocery store as she pulls the car into the carport. My dad wakes up from his nap, kind of gets up, stumbles to the kitchen. I, the way our house was arranged, the carport was in the back door in the TV room. And so my mom comes in, hands full of groceries. And as she walks in front of the TV, she says to me, Bart, uh, go get the rest of the groceries out of the car. To which I said, in a minute. Because I... I was convinced this was the episode Gilligan was going to actually get off the island. (laughs) And so as I'm glued to the TV set, suddenly, I was kind of a scrawny kid, wore glasses, had braces. Suddenly, my glasses were just all cattywampering on my face, and something had struck me on the side of the head, and I looked in my lap, and it was a box of Kellogg's Frosted Flakes. And as I kind of put my glasses back on and looked to the doorway, my daddy was standing there holding a can of Del Monte green beans just looking at me. You see, because what I had interpreted was that my mom had made a request when in fact she had issued a command. Now, the Bible that you hold in your laps is translated into English, but in its original language, in the Greek language, which is much more expressive, much more precise than the English language, there are multiple forms of verbs, one of which is called an imperative verb form. It carries the urgency of a command. That's why I've titled this morning's message, The Imperatives of an Overflowing Life. These are the irreducible minimums. These are the requirements it takes in order for you to enjoy the overflowing, abundant life that God intends for you as his child to experience. These are not elective courses. These are required courses. These are imperatives that I would stand before God's church because you can go through any series titled anything you want to, any focus, but what I know is that on any given day, I would say to you, I don't know that I'm really feeling the abundant, overflowing life that God intends for me. Would you say that you're the same? Amen? Amen. This life ebbs and flows. Sometimes we're closer to God, further away from God. But what are the five imperatives? Now, you've got five fingers on your hand, and so everybody's got that. So I want you to hold your hand up because we're going to do the sermon in a sentence. The sermon in a sentence has five elements, the first of which is God's people. Say that with me. God's people in God's Word, enjoying God's provision, accessing God's power, power. 
engaging in God's game plan. When we look at the book of Ephesians, what you have in your lap in this sixth chapter book of Ephesians is perhaps one of the most precise consolidations of Paul's theology. It's more expansive in the book of Romans, but the book of Ephesians and Colossians, probably authored at the same time, at a point where, where Paul was in prison, is covering the same ground, but it is a beautifully rich and bountiful book. And all five of these imperatives you can find, let's take them apart one by one, shall we? The first is God's people. It's almost a given, but you'll, you'll miss it if, if you're not careful, and the church should never miss it. No sermon should ever miss the fact that in the assembly, in any gathering where the gospel is preached, where a man of God chooses to try to take God's word and speak to God's people, is that his assumption should be that there are some people in the room who are yet to trust Christ as their Lord and Savior. Friends, you cannot, you cannot, it is impossible for you to experience the overflowing abundance of the Christian life without being in Christ and without being a member of God's household. And there's no singular need more urgent more gripping than the need of lostness in any room where the gospel is preached. Paul is going to talk about being members of the household. In chapter 2, he's going to talk about what it is not to be God's kids. Because one of the things I'm going to ask to you today is, are you part of God's family? Are you one of God's kids? Because you can come in here week after week, you can hear all these sermons about the overflowing abundance of life that God intends for you, but you will not experience, you cannot experience, it is impossible to experience outside of the reality of being in Christ. Look at chapter 2 of Ephesians. This is the description that was applicable to all of us. If I could see like God sees... If I was like Jesus when Jesus walked the earth, he could look into a crowd and he could see only two kinds of people, those that were born again, alive in him, trusting in him, and those who were outside of the grace that he was offering. God sees you in only two dimensions, friends. You're either lost or you're saved. All of us have been lost. Have you been? You know, the funny thing about being a Christian a long time is you forget what it's like to be lost, do you? Do you? Do you remember when you were lost? Here's what Paul describes you as. You were dead, chapter 2, verses 1, in your trespasses and sins in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that's now working in all the sons of disobedience. Among two, we too were all the formerly lived in the lust of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of our mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. The, he goes on to talk about what it is to exist, verse 12, being separate from Christ, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel are excluded from God's people, strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope without God in the world. And yet the beauty of that very urgent description is in both cases in verse 4, he says, but God being rich in mercy with the great love with which he loved us, he made us alive together with Christ. Are you born again? Are you are you a child of God? Because you cannot experience the overwhelming abundance that God intends for you. Oh, he has so much for you. He has so much he wants to give you, do for you. He wants, uh, has so much that he wants to remove as it relates to the baggage of your life, whether it's a burden or the feelings of guilt or conviction or the, 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 the past that may be binding you or the addictions that may be tying you down. God has an abundant, overflowing life that he's designed just for you. In another part of Ephesians, it says that you're his workmanship. You're created in Christ Jesus in, unto good works, which he preordained for you to do. The Bible says that he saw my unformed substance before any of my days were, that he knit me together in my mother's womb, that I'm fearfully and wonderfully made, that the lamb was slain before the foundations of the world just for me. If I would have been the only person, the only sinner, Christ would have died for me 
And friends, he died for you. Are you his child? Because if you're not, if you're not, then uh, the, in preparing this sermon, the, the, like every sermon, there needs to be an opportunity for everybody to see the goodness of God, see the attractive things that he's offering you, and for you to be drawn to him, for you to sense the urgency and the absolute depravity of your need, and to recognize that there's only one solution, one answer, that's Christ Jesus, Christ Jesus the Lord. Paul, I mean, to Peter, when he preached in the book of Acts in verse four, uh, chapter 4, verse 12, summed it up this way. It's a moment where Peter preached his first sermon, and the Scripture said that the crowd was cut to the quick. They said, what, what must we do to be saved? And he simply said this, there's, there's salvation in nobody else. Listen, there's not multiple ways to God, despite what our culture wants to suggest. That tolerance between religious viewpoints should not and cannot be our highest core value. We should never back away from the, from the sheer teaching of Scripture to say Jesus is the only way to God. That doesn't mean that I haven't met some Muslims that were really good people. I, I, I've got some Muslim friends that pray more than most of you do. They're just praying to the wrong God. But there's no other nails, there's no one else, there's no other name under heaven that has been given among men whereby you what? You must be saved. When Jesus encountered people, good people, Nicodemus was a great guy. For instance, he was kind of one of the religious dudes of the day. He held a very high office in the, in the religious organizations. He came to Jesus by night. He said, you must, we, we know you must be from God because you're doing all these wonders and all these signs. And you know what, Jesus, he just cuts to the chase. He says, what, Nicodemus, you must be born again. If you're here today without Christ, if I could force you, I would. But it's not up to anybody forcing you to do anything. God's not going to force you to do anything. But oh, the beauty and the benefit of the gospel of the Jesus Christ and salvation through him and him alone. Friends, he is everything. He's everything you're looking for. And so, sermon in a sentence, finger one is what? God's people. Right? You with me? God's people. Say it with me. The second is this, in God's word. In God's word. You see, Paul, two or three times in this long six-chapter letter, prays that the eyes of their, uh, their, their heart might be enlightened so that they may know what the hope of his calling is, what the glorious inheritance of the saints is, that they might grow into the knowledge of God. I'm praying that God would give you a spirit of wisdom and of revelation in, in the knowledge of him. But friends, the, the, the word, the word of God the Word of God is what has the provision. Everything about this sermon as Paul moves through it has to do with the Word of God. And I'm going to suggest to you that we have kind of pulled the punch on what it is to spend time in God's Word. I preached three times a week. The church that I pastored met Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night. And some of the most faithful people that were in that church came all three services. And so they got to hear Scripture preached three times a week. But even if they preached and heard the scripture preached three times a week, I'm going to suggest to you that simply is not enough. You must be in God's word daily. You must read it daily. You must meditate upon it. You must memorize it because in the word, there is this essence of, of, of who God is and it's where the knowledge of God is found. There's nothing other than the word of God that's living and active and sharper than a double-edged sword. It will divide joint and marrow, soul and spirit. It judges the very thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. There's nothing other than the word of God where the promises of the Old Testament say it will never return unto him void. It will always accomplish the purpose for which it was sent forth. Is there a repetitive time in your day where you were in God's word, reading it daily, verse by verse? Are you studying it systematically? Because if the answer to that is no, and friends, I know the answer for the majority of New Testament Christians to the answer to that is no. They've never really 
consider the fact that the reason they're not experiencing the overwhelming abundance of God's life is that they have a no knowledge of God. They, they don't know a little bit about it, but, but friends, I've been studying uh, God's Word for years. I just, every time I go there, I'm learning God is showing me something new. How many of you have uh, an iPhone? I've got two daughters. They're grown now. One's 22, one's 20. They're home for the summer, so they're both back at the house. And as my girls have come back to the house, this is kind of what our dinners look like. My girls, my girls live their lives on their phones. And so I made a challenge to them. I said, hey, listen, why don't we do this together? Well, let's turn on, as a family, let's turn on this little thing, these buttons on our iPhone that will give us a screen, uh, a screen time report at the end of each week. It comes on Sundays. Do you, have you ever done that? Do you, do you know that this past week, I'm down 12% from last Sunday, and that's only because I've been working on this sermon. Last week, I spent an average of two hours and 37 minutes a day on my iPhone. Now, some of that's work-related. It's, it's unavoidable, but a lot of it is me reading news lines and checking Facebook and, and spying on my girl's Instagram accounts and things like that. <laughs> and the thought occurred to me, I wonder, did I spend two hours and 37 minutes on average a day in God's Word? memorizing it, reading it, meditating upon it, studying it. This week, probably answer yes, because I was preparing to preach. But friends, let me tell you something. If you want to experience the overwhelming, abundant, overflowing life that God has for you, you must prioritize and commit yourself to digesting this book. There is no other book that is truth. Listen, I've been reading novels just to kind of relax, but I, I've just almost put those down. I, there's so much of this book that I want to know, so much more that, 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 I, that I haven't yet grasped. So I'm just simply saying you cannot, you cannot experience the overflowing abundance that God would have for you unless you're in God's Word, increasing in the knowledge and growing up in all aspects to maturity in Christ. Turn over, if you would, in, in the letter of Ephesians uh, to the fourth chapter. As you're turning there, when I was a little bitty boy, I think I mentioned I was the smaller of the two boys. My brother was always bigger, faster, better. And uh, we had, I bet, we did, I bet a bunch of people in the room did this. We have, a, we have a door frame in our house still where my daddy would mark our growth. You know, we'd back up. I'd try to stand real tall and he would mark Marcus and, and date us. Y'all, it, you, did y'all do that at your house? Or are we just weird in Southeast Texas? And so I can see on that wall, you know, my name and my brother's name. He's always a little taller than me. And, um, and, and we did it to our dad. But our dad would mark his head. And he'd say, some days you boys will be as tall as your daddy. I think, oh, man, that's just going to be great. Because I was a shrimp of a kid. And... Um, and, and, and so today, at age 60, my dad's been dead almost 30 years. But if I go back to the house where mom still is, I can stand on the wall, and now I've grown into the stature of my father. I remember how much I wanted that when I was a little boy. Listen to Paul's words in chapter 4. He's talking about what God has done inside of the church, the gifts that he's given, and why he gave the gifts. He gave some, in verse 11, to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, some pastors, some teachers. Why? For the equipping of the saints, he says. For the work of the service, to the building up of the body of the Christ, uh, to the uh, building up of the body of Christ, until we attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a mature man. To the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ, which results in the fact that we will no longer be children, tossed here and there by waves, carried back by every wind of doctrine, but by the trickery of men, craftiness of the deceitful scheming. But speaking the truth in love, what are we supposed to do? We are to grow up in all aspects into him who is the head, even Christ. Late night TV uh, when I was growing up was Johnny Carson. How many say that? Remember Johnny Carson? I remember when Joan Rivers would, would be the guest host for Johnny Carson. What was her favorite line? Oh, grow up. Remember her saying that? 
Paul said that to the Corinthian church. He came to him and said, listen, I, I wanted to give you solid food. I wanted to give you something, but you're still babes in Christ. I'm still having to feed you baby food, milk. And I remember when my oldest was a little bitty kid, and, and she was getting away from the bottle, and she was starting to eat those jars of baby food that stink like high heaven. Do y'all do that? And I was trying to feed her, and she was spitting this thing out. So I thought, well, I'm going to demonstrate for her. And so I took Daddy, I took, I took, it was awful. we've got to grow up. Do you know what causes you to grow up into the Lord, the truths of Scripture? You know, we, we have these built-in lessons in our physical bodies. We get hungry, we eat three times a day, don't we? You just, it's just natural. I pass a Bucky's, I stop and eat if I'm hungry or not. Jesus, you know, when he started his public ministry, he, he was driven into the wilderness where he was tempted by Satan, the devil, for 40 days and 40 nights. And Scripture says, and at the end of it, he was hungry. And you remember what Satan's first temptation to him was? He said, if you're the Son of God, just point to that stone and turn it into a loaf of bread. You're hungry, man. You remember what Jesus said? Even after 40 days, when his physical body was screaming for something, he says, man does not live by bread alone, but by everything that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. How many times are you pulling up to the table and consuming this book? Because the second imperative is that you must be in the Word. Imperative number one, God's people. You say it? In God's Word. Enjoying God's provision. This is one that's not normal. And I read it, uh, or I came up with it after reading some of what uh, men are, that are called the Desert Fathers. Let me see if I can unpack it just a little bit. In uh, the 1600s, uh, the Westminster Catechism was a body uh, of literature that the church uh, wrote to try to teach the elements of the faith to their children. It consisted of 107 questions, very simple questions, and very deliberate answers. The very first question is, what is the chief end of man? What is the chief end of man? Why are we here? What are we doing? I mean, you know, come on, we are all born, we, we are all living a life, and, you know, we Sometimes God gives us 70, 80 days, but then we die and we're gone. Why in the world are we here? Do you know what the Westminster Catechism says to that as an answer? Say it out loud. To glorify God and enjoy Him forever. Can I ask you a very simple question? How much are you enjoying God? Because given the urgent demands of this life, this is not a natural one. If I were to tell you the story when I was just a young father and my girls were still baby girls, able to walk and talk, but, you know, not much else. And I came home from a hard day's worth of work. And they would say, Daddy's home, Daddy's home. My wife used to make a big deal about, let me know when you're coming home so I can, you know, you know get the kids ramped up because you've got to take them for a couple of hours. <laughs> I'm going to kill him. No, I shouldn't say that. Daddy's coming home. He'll be here in 15 minutes. He better be here in 15 minutes. I'd walk in. My girl, Daddy's home. Daddy's home. We called it lap time with Daddy. That's what Laura called it. I need these kids out of my hair for at least this much time if you want to have something to eat. And so my girls would climb up in my lap. We just had this routine where they'd crawl up in my lap. Oh, Daddy, we love you, Daddy. I said, well, I love you, girls. What have you been doing? We just talk and, 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 and you know. Just, 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 oh, I call it daddy lap time. Because what, the, what Paul describes in the book of Ephesians is very similar. That we've been raised and seated with him in the heavenly. So let me ask you a question. You see, this is part of praise and worship, but this is something much more. How much lap time are you spending with God? Just, just crawling up into his lap and adoring him. And, and reveling in everything that he's done. We sang about it today. And Paul dedicates the entire first chapter of just rehearsing it. The, the, the Chapter 1, 
beginning in verse 3 all the way through 14 is one singular sentence in the Greek, and it builds in a cadence, and it crescendos. And if I was a better, more eloquent preacher, I could preach it in such a way that it might whip you into a frenzy, but that's not the point. Listen to what he says. This is Paul writing to the church about what Christ, what God has done for them in Christ. Look at what he says. Chapter begins in verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies. In Christ, everything that we need, we have equipped in the heavenlies, in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we might be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us to adoption as sons through Christ Jesus to himself according to the kind intention of his will. You see, I could go and I could read, and in the first service, I did this. I made the first service when I pointed to them because they were looking kind of sleepy, just to be honest with you. So I said, hey, listen, here's what we're going to do. Every time I point to you, say you say, in Christ. So I went this, and they went. In Christ. In Christ. In Christ. And I just began to read this, and every time it came up, in Christ or in the beloved, or something that God has done for them in Jesus, I pointed to them, and they screamed out. He does do it over 23 times. And in the... Uh, totality of the writings of the Apostle Paul to the church. He uses the word in Christ over 90 times. And if you add to that, you see, for instance, he talked in about verse 6, to the praise of the glory of his grace, which he freely bestowed to us in the beloved. Well, that's not in Christ, but he's talking about in Christ. If you add the metaphorical descriptions that are parallel, he mentions it hundreds of times in his writings. How many times do you crawl up in the lap of a loving father and just simply say, oh God, thank you for blessing me with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Lord, thank you for choosing me before the foundations of the world so that I can be holy and blameless in your sight. Lord, what manner of love is it that in love you would predestine me to adoption as son through Christ? to yourself, according to the kind intention of your will, to the praise and the glory of your eyes. You see, one of the things that I've done with Ephesians is I've tried to start committing it to memory. And when I start feeling bad, do you feel bad some days? Do you have hard days like I do? Do you come home sometimes and want to kick the dog? Do you, do, do you come home sometimes and you're frustrated with somebody at work and sometimes the pressures of this world just kind of start pushing down on you and pulling you in so many directions that you just, man, you just you feel like you're just anchored to this world. Do you know what I do? I say, I got to go spend some time in daddy's lap. I got to crawl up into God's lap and start rehearsing everything that he's done for me. And you know what? When I start doing that, I start finding my spirits rising. If I'm depressed, I start feeling better. In fact, if I'm mad, I start feeling happy. If I need to forgive somebody, I'll forgive somebody. Before it's over, I'll start singing praise songs as God's starting to bring to my mind. You, you see, friends, you've got to, if you want to experience the overflowing abundance that God intends for you to, I'm going to tell you, this life is hard. And some days it's going to try to drag you down, which means you've got to have a, a time where you are continually rejoicing and recalling to mind the provision that God has made for you. Do you know why? Because it is sufficient. It's enough. I don't care how bad my day is going. What God has done for me is enough to weather that storm. The circumstances somehow become to seem manageable when they were previously Immanageable. So God's people say it. God's, come on now, God's people in God's word. Rejoicing in God's provision. You see, I bet a bunch of people in this room need to hear that one. You need to think about what it is to be more thankful for what God has done for you. Accessing God's power is the next one. I'm going to tell you this. You do not have the power it takes to live the Christian life. You simply do not. Nor do I. And the day that we think we do, we will certainly fall. That's what the scripture says, Bart. If you think you can stand, take heed lest you fall. The Bible describes me as a frail creature of dust. I'm born again. I'm sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. But I've got to be empowered by a God who is omnipotent. Omnipotent. 
I don't possess what it takes to stand in the marketplace and be the kind of man that God has called and demanded and commanded me to be, and neither do you. Which is why when we fail, you could forensically diagnose it and say, where was it that I failed to plug into the power that God has for me? You see, I used my iPhone earlier as an illustration. I could also pick up this iPhone and say, it's very beneficial to me. I use it every day. I do all sorts of things with this. But do you know the last thing I do before I turn out the lights at night, right? I plug it in, makes a cute little noise, ding, and I just put it down. You know what it's doing all night? Absolutely nothing. Except being empowered by a power source outside of itself. And it's recharging. I, I, I've got a King Ranch pickup truck. I really like to drive it. But do you know when it gets to, the longer I drive it, if I just keep driving it, at some point it's going to run out of gas. And it will fail to do what I expect it to do. So I've got to stop and I've got to refuel it. See, Christians are no different. If there's not a time in your, in your day where you're spending time in God's Word, where you're rejoicing in God's provision, but accessing his power, you're, you're positioning yourself not to experience the overflowing, abundant life that he promises you. You've got you've to plug into the power. Several times Paul, when he's praying, like in chapter 1, verses 18, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you can know some things, the hope of his calling, the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. But he said, I want you to know this. I want you to know what the surpassing greatness of his power is toward those who believe. This is the same power that was in, in accordance with the working of the strength of his might when he raised Jesus from the dead. In the second prayer, which is in chapter 3, Beginning in verse 15, he said, I'm praying, I'm bowing my knees before the Father that he would grant to you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with power through his spirit, his Holy Spirit, in the inner man. I, I tell you, sometimes when I used to be a pastor and people would come in and need counseling, I could just tell they were flat, worn out. And I'd say, how much time are you spending in God's Word? Well, Pastor, I, I, know, I used to spend a lot of time. I, I said, but you've got to get back in the Word. They're, they're so in need of a recharge. Many times I would take them out on retreats where we could just get away. So listen, we're going to go away. I need you to take a Bible and a notebook, and that's all we're going to do. We're just going to get back. We're going to get still. We're going to hear from God, and we're going to plug into Him and repower ourselves. Is there a time where you are still and just trying to recharge with the Lord. Because if there's not, friend, that could be one of the things that you're missing in experiencing this abundant, overwhelming uh, life that God intends for you. But because of God's people, because of all that God has done for us in Christ, because we have his word and because his word can make us strong and give us knowledge and give us expanded understanding and because we can then begin to rejoice in, in his provision and be empowered from him, he does all of those things so that he can look at the church and say, gear up, suit up, you've got to get in the game. Because before Paul reaches the end of the epistle in chapter 6, he's saying, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might, chapter 6, verse 1. That's a passive tense Greek, by the way. It's better translated, be strengthened by the Lord and in the power of his might. But in verse 2, he gives an imperative command. Put on the full armor of God so that you might stand up against the schemes of the devil. If you're a child of God in this room, particularly if you're being used by God, even as you go to a new workplace, you're going to go to a new workplace with new kids, right? I would tell you that you ought to expect some level of spiritual warfare even as you begin this new role. And, and, and so you're going to go now into a, a marketplace and you're going to have a new level of impact on kids. And so what the scripture says, don't show up unless you are properly prepared. And, and every day, part of our time of preparation to meet the demands of our day, after spending time in God's word, after rejoicing in everything that God has done, after being empowered by God, and, and, and we, we ought to then say, okay, I, I've got to get ready for this day. Put on the full armor of God. So that having withstood all things, uh, all evil things in that day, you might be standing instead of on your back. 
And you with the armor of God, y'all just did this in vacation Bible school, I understand. Who knows the armor of God? All right, got some vacation Bible school teachers here. The belt of, which is the word of God. Jesus, before his crucifixion, said in his prayer to God, God, sanctify my disciples in the truth. Thy word is truth. There is truth. Truth is not relative, by the way, much to what our culture is suggesting to us now. There is black and white truth. It is in God's word. And our marketplace is trying to tear that down, but that's not true. So we've got to teach our kids what is true. We've got to be armed with truth. We have to have our loins girded with the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf in order that we might become the righteousness of God in him. You have imputed righteousness, perfection from, from Christ. But as your life becomes more sanctified, you should be becoming more and more righteous. Sin should become less and less of an issue in your life. God does not intend for us just to keep on sinning. He wants us to become like him. And so that's why the scripture says, work out your salvation with great fear and trembling because I've had some people, oh, pastor, I'm saved. I've witnessed to people as we've gone out in visitation. Yeah, I made a, I prayed a prayer on a you know, hilltop when I was in sixth grade at youth camp. I said, well, have you ever been to church? No, nah, living like the devil. I said, man, you got to work out your, 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 your salvation with great fear and trembling because part of salvation is sanctification. When you were indwelt with the Holy Spirit of promise, you can't sin and feel good about it anymore. And if you do sin and feel good about it, it means you become calloused. You need to be retenderized. But, but I guess what I'm saying is we've got to get prepared for the battle. Uh, the belt of truth, the blessed plate of righteousness, feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. How beautiful are the feet that bring the good news. You do recognize that everywhere you go, today, tomorrow, the day after, you're Christ's ambassadors. You're carriers of the gospel. It's not your pastor or your staff's job to lead other people to Jesus, give a word, to give a reason for the hope. That it's our job. It's your job. It's all of our jobs. We're supposed to be billboards for Jesus, to make him look so utterly attractive that people come to us and say, well, I, I, I don't know what you've got, but it's something that I think I'm interested in. Tell me what it is. Well, it's, it's about Jesus. Belt of truth, breastplate of righteousness, feet shod with the gospel, preparation of peace, helmet of salvation, the shield of faith to quench the fiery darts of the devil, the sword of the spirit, which is your offensive weapon, and you are to pray, 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 pray. One of the fun things that happened in our family, my brother and I uh, always wanted to be professional football players. You, know, you grew up thinking, oh, what do you want to be when you grow up? I want to play for the Dallas Cowboys. That's what we would say as little big kids. I have pictures of my brother and I in these fake NFL costumes that my parents bought us for Christmas. He had two boys, and I can see the same picture. My brother sent a picture of his boys when they were about the same age. He said, look, look, at the, look at you and me, and look at, look at Vance and Tyler. Well, the big difference between Vance and Tyler, mine was the small one. Vance was the small one. Vance grew up to be a big one, and he got drafted in the second round of the NFL, played eight years in the NFL, just finished and retired with the Pittsburgh Steelers. And so I've watched him play NFL football. And as he got to kind of live the dream that my brother and I always wanted to do, uh, we got to see the rhythm of what it is to play NFL football. Let me tell you something. How absurd would it be on Sunday if my nephew, Vance McDonald, would have walked out of the dressing room in his shorts and his T-shirt without his shoulder pads, his helmets, his shin guards, six, seven, runs like a deer, can catch a football. I mean, he was a phenomenal football player. But it would have been absurd. It would have been absurd. Coach Tomlin would have said, what are you doing? Get back in the, you know, where's your helmet? Where's your, where's your pads? I mean, it's game time. Man, we're fixing to blow a whistle, kick a ball, and people are going to try to kill each other. Come on. <laughs> and so you have an opponent, and he has a scheme to not only defeat you individually, but he has a scheme to keep you completely disengaged from the game plan that he has for even this church to carry out. Friends, your neighborhoods are lost. They're not, they're not saved. But if you can get God's people into God's word, rejoicing in God's provision, accessing God's power, and engaged in God's game plan, there is absolutely no telling what God could do through Leon Springs Baptist Church. So I've got some questions for you. I hope everybody asks and answers them individually.
as our musicians prepare to come up, we're going to have a time of invitation today. Because the most important question I'm going to ask is, are you a member of the family of God? Are you one of God's kids? Has there ever been a time in your life where you know beyond any shadow of a doubt that you were in Christ? Because, friends, if you do not, if you're not in Christ, you, are, you, you have no hope in this world. You may say, well, man, Pastor, you don't know me. I've got all sorts of stuff going on. I've got a big house, big car, great job, good-looking wife, great kids. None of that will make one bit of difference five seconds into an eternity separated from God. None of it will. There is a reality and a teaching of life that this life is but a vapor compared to eternity. Are you in part of God's people? I believe that many people will have to really grapple with this one. Are you in God's word? I believe every Christian can recommit and reprioritize their life to say, I, I, I think that might be the point that God intends for me to do business with. I got to be I got to be in God's word more. I need to study it more. I need to memorize it more, meditate upon it more. Are you in God's word? Uh, are you rejoicing in God's provision? Are, are, is it, are you spending daddy lap time with Jesus and God the Father, just reveling in everything he's done for you? Are you in daily engaged in his power? And are you engaging in his kingdom agenda? Some people in this room have probably been asked to serve in this church. Maybe there's something the church needs. You do realize that God didn't save you just to sit, right? He saved you to serve. There's something for you to do in this body. Maybe you said no, and maybe today you'll think, well, maybe I should have said yes. These are very simplistic questions. And quite honestly, this is a very simplistic sermon. Five imperatives. What are they? God's people? Say it. Come on, people. In God's word. Father, the word has been preached and your people have heard. I pray now that you would draw us to decisions. Lord, let the word cut us where it needs to and encourage us where it needs to. And Lord, in, in this moment, I pray that you would pour out your spirit amongst your people. The scripture is pretty clear that no sermon delivered by a mortal man does anything other than take about 35, 40 minutes. The impact of a sermon is completely your business. No man, no woman, no boy, no girl can come unless they're drawn. No decision can be made unless you convict and move. And so, Father, would you pour out your spirit on your church? Would you use this word, your word, to sharpen? Lord, would you use us as your people to do your bidding. We just pray this, Lord, in your son's name and for the sake of his kingdom. Listen, there's going to be some people here to receive you. I do believe that every time the word is preached, you have to have a time of decision. And so if you're not saved in this room, there's nothing more important than I'd like to do than show you how you you could be uh, saved today. These other questions may prompt you to other decisions. You may just want to come and pray, recommit yourself. However God speaks to you in this time, As we stand to our feet, listen for the voice of God. Listen and do what he says. Let's stand to our feet and sing. The Bible says that God is working all around us and God is working in you. So I want to urge you to respond to God's truth. And if you're looking for a church home, at Leon Springs Baptist, we are a healing place in this hurting world. We're equipping people to serve God. So I want to invite you to join us at 9 a.m. or 1030 a.m. on Sundays, or you can catch us on Facebook Live or YouTube Live at 1030 a.m. And I want to end by saying, God loves you and you can trust in the goodness of God. Thank you for joining us.